holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific, technological elite. We've signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets. We're included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Greetings, my friends. This is Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. I am the editor-in-chief of Technocracy News. And today is April 26, 2019. The year is flying by, and there's plenty of news coming out every day about technocracy and all of the things that it brings with it. Today, we're going to knock off a couple of uh, quick stories and get to the meat of this broadcast which has to do with China, Wall Street, and Western corporations. But first, I want to point out an article titled, Beware Robot Emotions. Simulated love is never love. Well, this is pretty self-evident to most people. It's plainly evident that humans already have a strong emotional tendency to transfer attachment to inanimate objects. I remember people in years past who named their cars, for instance, cute names, and they referred to them as their friend or by the name. This tendency is well documented. If robot makers, on the other hand, exploit this tendency, then robot owners may have no idea that they're being led into an emotional addiction from which escape will be very difficult. And this article starts out, this is just an example of this, says, when a robot dies, does it make you sad? For lots of people, the answer is yes. And by the way, this reminds me of some movies in the past. I remember there was one about a cute little robot called Chappy. He's very emotional, and people got very emotionally attached to him. There's another movie recently that um, has to do with um, Transformers, and that movie has a cute little Volkswagen bug in it called Bumblebee. And the robot gets emotionally attached to the little girl, and And the little girl gets very emotionally attached to the robot who pretends to have human emotions. But, of course, they can't have human emotions because they're not human. So there's a trap. Beware. Robots that fake human emotions are faking it. Don't respond to them. Force yourself to not respond to them. Now, the second story is a little more tragic and is certainly not lighthearted at all. The headline is, To Hide Surveillance Tech, Feds Drop Child Porn Cases. This will blow your mind. It is absolutely, deeply disturbing that courts are actually dropping criminal cases of child porn perpetrators in order to shield or hide the government's clandestine surveillance software that was used to bring the charges in the first place. How this came about is that the feds created public-private partnerships with private companies in order to create a wall of secrecy to hide behind. You say, well, how do they do this? Well, when a software company approaches the government and says, we have this great piece of software that you can, for instance, install like a keystroke logger on somebody else's computer without their knowledge of it, And the government says, boy, we'd like that one. They say, well, we'd like to give it to you or or sell it to you. We'd like to make a partnership here, so we'll let you use it. We'll license the software to you to use, but we control the software. This is proprietary software for us. We've got patents on it or we've got copyrights on it or whatever. We have non-disclosure agreements in place. And by the way, you'll have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, Mr. Government. So when... Child porn perpetrators are apprehended using the software that's been secretly installed on computers without their knowledge. By the time it gets to court, the defense attorneys very naturally want to see the software. And guess what? The software company shows up and says, sorry, judge, you can't release that information because that is proprietary information to us. 
That's our trade secrets. You're not allowed to expose our trade secrets to anybody else, even the court. And so the court ends up in a position to where it has to dismiss the case because it's pretty obvious that if somebody's going to be charged with child pornography, that's a pretty serious charge, that they have a right to face their accuser. It says so in the Constitution. Well, if, if, if they're unable to face their accuser, then the court has no choice but to throw it out. Now, I want to point out that the government has been using this, this uh, secrecy, this privacy wall to hide behind and say, it's not us, We're, you know, plausible deniability, we can't help it. It's the software company that has a proprietary interest here to which we must say, shame on the government in the first place for entering into a public-private partnership with companies that would do this to us. Shame on them. I also want to remind you that public-private partnerships are a creation of the United Nations and a sustainable development program effort. This is where public-private partnerships came from. You mark my words on this, they will become the scourge of life around the world as corporations gain the upper hand in all areas of society. In this case, they're meddling with our legal system, and our legal system cannot work as it should work because government officials have entered into these public-private partnerships. These need to be broken flat out. And if the government wants to license software from a software development company, that's fine. I'm sure they do that all the time. I mean, Microsoft, for instance, with uh, its suite of Office products like PowerPoint and, and Microsoft Word and so on, the government licenses, I'm sure, hundreds of millions of dollars of that software. There's no problem with making a, a license agreement with a software company. But to enter into a non-disclosure agreement where you are unable to reveal the source and the character and the nature of the software that, that wants to convict somebody of a crime, you have stepped over the line. Citizens should demand, and whether on a local level, a state level, county level, or a national level, citizens should demand that public-private partnerships are taken out of the portfolio of options for civic leaders. Simply don't do it. You cannot win. You will not win. And in every case, eventually, the public is the one that's going to get hosed with the results of these partnerships. And this is a good example. Some prosecutors and some human rights organizations are saying, actually, that some perpetrators that deserve to be convicted are going free because the defense attorneys come in and demand to see the software that brought the charges in the first place, and the government refuses to do it because they signed a nondisclosure agreement to not do it. Well, okay, enough of that. We need to get away from this. You need to be aware that this is very serious business when the government, when any government entity steps into a public-private partnership with a private company, it'll come back to bite you eventually. The last story is the most important story that I've seen in a long time, and we'll have opportunity to spend a little bit of time and talk about it. This is a, a must-see, must-read, must-listen-to-the-video type of an article. And I encourage everybody to go to the website, technocracy.news, look up this article. It's on the homepage today. It won't be tomorrow, but you can look it up. China is funded and backed by Wall Street and Western corporations. Let me say that again. China is funded and backed by Wall Street and Western corporations. My comments to this are, listen carefully to the video below. Steve Bannon, who is formerly the or was formerly the chief of uh, the campaign for the, um, the Trump campaign in the last election cycle, Steve Bannon pointedly reveals that the rise of China to be an existential threat to America is thanks to Wall Street and Western mega corporation, which I've been saying for years, by the way. But now this comes out of the mouth of Steve Bannon. Not only is he still a huge Trump supporter, but even more importantly than that, Bannon has his degree from Harvard University, and he worked as an investment banker for Goldman Sachs for many years. He knows what goes on inside of the investment world in Wall Street. He understates an insider. Now, for that reason, I don't particularly trust Steve Bannon on much of anything, but I just want to point out he's an insider who has decided to make this claim 
that Wall Street and the Western mega corporations have been the ones that have promoted the rise of China economically, militarily, etc., technology-wise, etc. Now I continue in my comments. This is a continuation of a long-term trend that the West is being destroyed from within its own ranks. Professor Anthony C. Sutton first exposed this nefarious collusion with his masterpiece books. He was a prolific writer on this, like Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, National Suicide. How does that sound? And then, of course, the book that I co-authored with Anthony Sutton in the late 1970s, Trilaterals Over Washington, which documented the, the machinations of the Trilateral Commission to create a new international economic order. And they, indeed, were the ones that really put the seeds into China for its growth that ensued after 1973, and they have become the face of the new international economic order, a technocracy. Now, I'll point out that Bannon's solution to back Trump is misguided, in my opinion. The solution is to reject technocracy, which is embedded within these same organizations, these international banksters. This is where technocracy is being promoted. Now, when I wrote my most recent book, Technocracy, the Hard Road to World Order, I noted in the preface and actually elsewhere in a couple other sections that I gave a tip of the hat to an early member of the Trilateral Commission by the name of Richard Gardner. He was an academic, and he wrote a paper for Foreign Affairs magazine called The Hard Road to World Order. That's the reason that I made the subtitle of my book, The Hard Road to World Order. And he wrote in this paper for Foreign Affairs magazine, in short, the house of world order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great, quote, booming, buzzing confusion. But an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. That's a direct quote. This was revolutionary thinking for this group of internationalists. Because previously, before 1973, the whole century had, be give, had been given over to frontal assaults trying to muscle the system by force into an international community. They all failed for one reason or another. America did not go along. Europe has had a different experience since then with the European Union, which is a model of technocracy as well in Europe, mostly promoted by members of the Trilateral Commission, I'll say. But the assaults that had happened starting way back with the Bolshevik Revolution had all failed and Americans had skated away without succumbing to the internationalist rain dance. Professor Sutton wrote prolifically about the transfer of technology from the West to the East that allowed these countries and organizations within these countries to prosper at the expense of the West. That is us. We lost, they won, they gained. China now, which has been defined by academics as a technocracy. I'm not going to argue that point at all anymore. That's a fact. China became a technocracy that it is today because of the machinations of members of the Trilateral Commission. It was Henry Kissinger, a member of the commission early in, under Richard Nixon, who went to China in the first place to bring China back onto the world stage to start the negotiation process. Zbigniew Brzezinski, when he was national security advisor under the Carter administration, almost all of whom were members of the Trilateral Commission. Zbigniew Brzezinski was the one who brought China and its leaders to America to bring them into the economic fold, to reintroduce them to the world. They were still a communist dictatorship at that point. They were still waving the red flag, promoting communism. That changed the day they met Brzezinski. Brzezinski introduced them to technocracy. And all of the companies that went over there to, to do infrastructure projects and build factories and things like that, you think those were all just Chinese firms? No, they weren't. They were American firms. They were Western firms. And in particular, Western firms that were connected to the Trilateral Commission. Now, others have come in since then, of course. There's been a, uh, a land rush, uh, if you will, a gold rush of companies that went over in the last 30, uh, 35 years that weren't associated directly with the Trilateral Commission. But because of those companies going over there, 
the small core that started the whole thing have gotten filthy stinking rich, including the, and especially the banks. Where do you think the money came from to finance these projects? Well, it came from the West, not the East. If it were not for our meddling, I say our, if it were not for the meddling of the internet of the, well, the, the global banking community centered in New York primarily, China would still be an agrarian society farming one acre rice paddies. We know that's not the case. They're now a military giant. And so as you listen to the video, especially with Steve Bannon and his sidekick here is Kyle Bass, a very well-known hedge fund operator. Listen to them speak. Listen to their language carefully. Not so much their conclusions about supporting Trump, because I'm believing more and more these days that Trump is acting more like a technocrat than he is a constitutionalist. But aside from that, just listen to what they're saying about how China has become the existential threat that it is today. It's because of Western bankers, period. Now, I have a selection. I just had to pull this off my bookshelf. I have in my hands a copy of Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution written by Anthony Sutton, published in, first in 1974. This was while he was still a research fellow at the Hoover Institution for War, Peace, and Revolution at Stanford University in California, Palo Alto, California, actually, beautiful area. And he was a, a careerist researcher and writer. His career started out at UCLA, but he soon moved up to the Hoover Institution when he received a fellowship there to be a research fellow. His colleagues called him the Hoover vacuum cleaner because he was like that. He spared no expense, at least time-wise, to research details on what he wrote about. And he wrote a lot. And he finally got booted from the Hoover Institution because he started writing about the Trilateral Commission. Now, that was not the right thing to do. He didn't quite realize that at the time, that it would get him fired because he thought there was some type of a, a moral code, at least, in academia, that opposing opinions would be tolerated by people that don't necessarily agree, but you can say what you believe in especially places like Stanford, which is supposed to be one of the better higher education places in the world. He found out differently because David Packard, at the time the president of Stanford University, was one of the original members of the Trilateral Commission. So when Sutton brought up the Trilateral Commission, starts writing about it and, you know, talking, asking around and asking questions and pulling papers and research and stuff from here and there, they saw early on that they better get rid of him. Because if he stayed there and published any kind of a major work, especially something like Trilaterals over Washington, on the letterhead of the Hoover Institution, that it would be curtains for the Trilateral Commission. So they kicked him out. And it crushed him, by the way. That's another story. But I met him soon after his departure, and that's how we got into the publishing business, writing business together, was to try and continue his research. And believe me, my company, the August Corporation, was no Hoover Institution. <laughs> Not hardly. We had two printing presses and a small office, and we had a lot of guts. That's all we had. We did some research. Sutton knew how to get the research out of the university system and, and public libraries. We just kept on going, plowing it out. But let me read you something that, that Sutton wrote in Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution from page 175 of his book. This will give you an idea, a flavor of what Steve Bannon is talking about. It's been going on for a very long time. From these unlikely seeds grew the modern internationalist movement, which included not only the financiers Carnegie, Paul Wahlberg, Otto Kahn, Bernard Baruch, and Herbert Hoover, but also the Carnegie Foundation and its progeny International Conciliation. The trustees of Carnegie were, as we have seen, prominent on the board of American International Corporation. In 1910, Carnegie donated $10 million, of course, to found the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And among those on the board of trustees were Elihu Root of the Root Mission to Russia in 1917, Cleveland H. Dodge, financial backer of President Wilson, George W. Perkins, a Morgan partner, G.J. Balch, AIC and Amasink, R.F. Herrick, AIC, H.W. Pritchett, also with AIC, and other Wall Street luminaries. Woodrow Wilson, under the powerful influence and indeed was financially indebted to this group of internationalists, 
As Jennings C. Wise has written, historians must never forget that Woodrow Wilson made it possible for Leon Trotsky to enter Russia with an American passport. But Leon Trotsky also declared himself an internationalist. We have remarked with some interest his high-level internationalist connections, or at least friends, in Canada. Trotsky, then, was not pro-Russian or pro-Allied or pro-German, as many have tried to make him out to be. Trotsky was for world revolution, for world dictatorship. He was, in a word, an internationalist. Bolshevists and bankers have then this significant common ground, internationalism. Revolution and international finance are not at all inconsistent if the result of revolution is to establish more centralized authority. International finance prefers to deal with central governments. The last thing the banking community wants is a laissez-faire economy and decentralized power because these would disperse power. This, therefore, is an explanation that fits the evidence. This handful of bankers and promoters was not Bolshevist or communist or socialist or democrat or even American. Above all else, these men wanted markets, preferably captive international markets, and a monopoly of the captive world market as the ultimate goal. They wanted markets that would be exploited monopolistically without fear of competition from Russians, Germans, or anyone else including the American businessmen outside the charm circle. This closed group was apolitical and amoral. It had a single-minded objective, a captive market in Russia, all presented under and intellectually protected by the shelter of a league to enforce the peace. Wall Street did indeed achieve its goal. American firms controlled by this syndicate were later to go on and build the Soviet Union and today are well on their way to bringing the Soviet military-industrial complex into the age of the computer. Today, the objective is still alive and well. This is 1974 he's writing this. John D. Rockefeller expounds it in his book, The Second American Revolution, which sports a five-pointed star on the title page. This book contains a naked plea for humanism. That is, a plea that our first priority is to work for others. In other words, a plea for collectivism. Humanism is collectivism. It is notable that the Rockefellers who have promoted this humanistic idea for a century have not turned their own property over to others. Presumably, it is implicit in their recommendation that we all work for the Rockefellers. Rockefeller's book promotes collectivism under the guises of, quote, cautious conservatism and, quote, the public good. It is, in effect, a plea for the continuation of the earlier Morgan Rockefeller support of collectivism, enterprises, and mass subversion of individual rights. In brief, the public good has been, as it is today, used as a device and an excuse for self-aggrandizement by an elitist circle that pleads for world peace and human decency. But so long as the reader looks at world history in terms of an inexorable Marxian conflict between capitalism and communism, the objectives of such an alliance between international finance and international revolution remains elusive. So will the ludicrousness of promotion of the public good by plunderers. If these alliances still elude the reader, then he should ponder the obvious fact that these same international interests and promoters are always willing to determine what other people should do, but are signally unwilling to be first in line to give up their own wealth and power. Their mouths are open, their pockets are closed. Close quote. Anthony Sutton nailed what Steve Bannon says today, back in 1974. And actually, earlier than that, he was writing about the transfer of technology from west to the east, way back in the late 1950s, early 60s. But he absolutely nailed it in these more modern books, the Wall Street series. This is where the trouble began well over 100 years ago. This is where it is today, and that is exactly what Steve Bannon has declared 
in this video publicly on CNBC. I don't know how many people are shook to the root because of what he said, but I am because it validates everything that Anthony Sutton has written about. He's now since deceased, by the way, but everything he's written about, spoken about, and also as a result of the research that we did back then, I have said the same thing ever since. Now we have it confirmed in the modern context by Steve Bannon and Kyle Bass. So much for independence, so much for sovereignty. We go back to the statement that I read earlier by Richard Gardner. In short, the house of world order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion. Sure sounds like today to me. But an end run around national sovereignty eroding it piece by piece will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. If I were to mimic Paul Harvey a little bit, I would say, and now you know the rest of the story. I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. Have a great day.